Previously on Colorado Experience. Before it was Colorado, this was Indian country, and it still is. The most important part about who we are as a people is we're Buffalo people. They introduced policies and encouraged people to just kill bison without harvesting their meat or their hides or anything, simply because they knew that that would weaken the tribes on the plains. Early conservation started in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And then you also had tribes who had continued to try to cultivate herds. So there were small herds that were then revived. People drive down I-70 and they're like, oh, there's buffalo. You know, so people stop just to look at them because they're a part of our history. So we're taking these buffalo, these bison, and returning them home. We are caretakers of the earth, and as caretakers, we want to show respect to all living things. So that's sort of our relationship with the bison. It's not just some creature out there. My name is Jesse Lassiter. I'm the bison herd manager for the Southern Ute Tribe, and my job is to keep the herd happy, healthy, and inside the fences. I'll turn off the truck. You can hear them talking. So that grunting is the mamas talking to the babies. They know who's who, and that's how they find their mom is through their grunting. Back when I started in 2015, the herd was about 31 animals. We started buying animals and integrating a breeding program. And in four years, we were able to bring it up to about, you know, over 100 head and been able to maintain it at that, all while, you know, still maintaining a harvest schedule to provide meat to the tribal membership. Currently, we have a bison meat distribution program, and that's important because it's healthier for our community. We have a lot of diabetes, and so having uh, high protein, uh, low fat meat to feed our families is really important. Uh, a tribal member will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm looking to pick up my bison meat, so we'll walk them through, and we've got a variety of cuts. So we've got roasts that come, uh, all various sizes. Uh, here's a, a boneless shoulder roast. So with that meat distribution program, tribal members can come in and get five pounds of bison meat per household per month for free. A lot of it's steaks, roasts, stew meat. I try to mix it up. We get ribs in there once in a while, bones, uh, soup bones. I'm really proud of, um, I think, the work that has gone into strengthening and building our herd, where we've even grown to be able to offer meat year round. That wasn't always the case, um, but now we can do that. And I really believe that being able to practice your culture is preventative to all sorts of other things that impact Native people, especially Southern Utes. And so being able to learn about um, healthy, like nutrition, bison meat is much healthier than beef. And so teaching different recipes um, that are some traditional sorts of recipes, but also ways to integrate that meat today, I think is really important. Food is what brings us together, and for Native peoples, that is our survival. And I don't mean from like a consumption standpoint, I mean, food is what's maintained us and kept us here. My name is Ben Jacobs. I am the co-owner, co-founder of Tokabe American Indian Eatery. I'm a member of the Osage Nation, which is located in Northeast Oklahoma. And Buffalo, we're so much a part of the diet of many Native communities prior to contact. Then after that, it became a source of kind of destruction. It was how can we kind of rid these animals of the land, because then it can take away a main food source of native peoples. And so it's a very sad history, but they're a really unique creature that we still have. And to be able to bring that back and support that growth in a very sustainable, thoughtful way 
is really important. So that's why it was really important for us to incorporate that and to really make sure that we support the bison um, ranchers, you know, and the caretakers of the land in Colorado and beyond. We eat bison to restore bison. And we have a goal of 1 million head in the United States. Right now there's 450,000 bison. So farmers and ranchers by raising them for meat production and the more consumers that eat a bison burger and a bison steak are helping bring the species back. It seems silly when you're in restaurants like, well, we serve this for people to eat, but that was our sustaining food for a very long time. And it's something that can continue the existence of that with having care and actually caring about the animal rather than the destruction of the animal. Come on, big girl. I'm Rex Moore, I'm the owner of Rock River Ranches. We are in Ray, Colorado, where I'm finishing out some of my bison. Rock River Ranches is a bison production company. And whether it's meat production, breeding stock, and even selling all the pieces parts. So all things bison is what I sell and produce uh, with this herd. Justin, you good? Yep, we're good. Today we are going to be checking visual ear tags, EIDs or electronic identification. Then we're going to give them their pre-breeding shots and we're giving them a dewormer as well. Good. So it's prepping for good health for the coming breeding season and out on grass. Come on, big girl. Come on, get up, baby. We'll actually be weighing them today. Wait. 890. 890, okay. My average cow herd weight size is about 1,080 pounds to 1,100 pounds, kind of in that range. A calf, when it's born, is going to be between 40 and 60 pounds, very small. A mature herd bull that is five years and older is going to weigh 2,200 to 2,700 pounds. This is a hydraulic livestock chute for both cattle or bison, but it's been specially adapted for bison with this head gate on it. We have a, a black plastic tarp on this because a bison won't hit or try to go through something that's solid. And we need to work them through the chutes so that we can take better care of them. You have to remember that bison are still more wild than they are domesticated. They are trainable. Uh, they can be gentle, but they are still a very large, powerful animal, and so you have to be careful. The cowboys here all have flags. We don't use whips, we don't use electronic hot shots or anything like that. So it's all about proper animal handling and safe handling, and the flags seem to work really good with bison. To become a bison rancher, you have to have the passion and the interest in, in raising bison. And it's gonna take some investment on facilities because you need taller fences, you need stronger corrals, you need bigger chutes uh, to work them in. After that, once they're out on the range, they're actually easier to take care of than cattle. So we're grass-fed, grain-finished. And that helps provide consistency and quality flavor tenderness, so it's all about tenderness, taste, quality, and that bison eating experience. We've had an amazing relationship with Rex Moore over at Rock River for probably a decade now, and that's why it's great to have that relationship with Rex, is not only can we talk about the food, but we can talk about the people that put their hands on where the food comes from. Tokabe American Indian Eatery came out of an idea that my business partner, Matt Chandra, and I had, and it was really about why native foods wasn't readily available on a daily basis outside of community events, family gatherings, powwows, things like that. And really what we wanted to do was create that in the culinary restaurant environment. This is our braised bison. We braise it overnight. I want to say this is our most flavorful meat that we have. Super tender. It is so good. Having bison available to eat is incredibly important on many levels. I mean, if we just look at the very surface level, it's a highly nutritious red meat. But from us also, from a cultural standpoint, it is about 
being able to say that this was and still is our animal and an animal that's deeply rooted in our communities. A lot of indigenous communities use the buffalo in different ways, obviously for food. It's such a such a healthy protein and a, a food source for our people that has been in our DNA for a long time. So having that reconnection to indigenous foods back into our systems has been so important. Hi, how are you doing? What can I get for you? Should I have the bison? The shredded or the ground? Uh, shredded. For us, it's the stories of where it comes from and why we still utilize it, making sure that people understand that food is not just about being a superfood. It's about the origin of where it comes from, the history of where it comes from. They're such a godsend to our indigenous communities. They are all about sourcing and providing indigenous foods to the community, whether you're native or not native. And uh, what's really cool is that they do traditional rices and vegetables and things that were indigenous to the lands, you know, before things got replaced with other crops, etc. Stuffed up. When people come in and it's a native restaurant, they're like, what is Osage hominy salsa? What does braised bison look like? What is Eco's green chili stew? Like, what are these things? So we wanted people to be able to see the food. We wanted engagement with our crew because it's something that they can be connected to and something that they can speak to and have passion about and show up to work and have someone that may not look like them, someone's of a different age bracket to actively be interested in them and what's this and their community and their identity, especially for us making it a part of our communities again that people understand that it's important to our culinary experience which is important to our cultural identity because it's just so important for our health and our well-being to really get that food source and that sovereignty of food sovereignty back into our systems and back into our communities that was stolen from us my name is danielle seawalker i am hunkpapa lakota from the standing rock sioux nation um, of North Dakota, but I currently reside in Denver, Colorado. I'm an artist, I'm kind of an activist, which I say artivist. Right now we are on campus at CU Boulder in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm working on a mural centered around the buffalo. I had gotten a random email from a student who is part of the indigenous student body populations and clubs and organizations, and she had mentioned that they wanted to have some more indigenous representation here on campus, and so I was tasked to do that in the engineering building. So I'm able to sort of do that for the indigenous students and faculty here on campus. There is an indigenous student body here, but it's almost like nobody would really know that. There's nothing that conveys that indigenous students are here learning. And my whole intent on conveying um, indigenous people is through our indigenous knowledge, our ancient indigenous knowledge. And also I couldn't help myself but to do a buffalo knowing that their mascot is also the buffalo too. Seeing bison and buffalo on campus has become so normalized. I mean, that just, it's in the water almost at CU Boulder uh, and really in the West in general. I mean, you see bison all over in the Rocky Mountain West. To me, there's no animal that's more iconic in the American West than the bison. It symbolizes so much about what Americans want to see in themselves what they wanted to see in their own history, how they made sense of what was happening around them in the West. Bison in many ways symbolize the conflicting ideas about the West, that on the one hand, the West is a place to be conquered and tamed, but on the other hand, it has always been this place of respite and beauty and wildness, quote unquote wildness. And so how can you hold both of those things at once? Well, bison have always kind of symbolized and represented those competing narratives of the West. The bison has always reflected Americans' attitudes towards nature and the way they thought about the natural world, especially in the West. Nothing about the history or contemporary life in the West is simple. It's all quite complex, like much of human life. So it feels important to have the discussion about bison because in many ways I think they also symbolize where we're at today with how we manage this contested space of the Western U.S. and how we try to find our way forward with a lot of really different ideas about how we should manage the land and manage people and manage animals. And that to me feels like a uh, reason why we should continue to focus on bison. It's not just because it's cool to see a giant animal run out on the football field.
Alfie is the live mascot for the University of Colorado. Uh, she runs on Folsom Field before the Colorado Buffaloes play, and she's also a bit of a local celebrity. Oh, touchdown, Ralphie! Touchdown, Colorado! How about that, man? Running a live buffalo, when you think about it, I mean, you're sitting there in Folsom, and you're getting all hyped up. You're in your locker room. You're getting ready. You come out, and there standing in front of you is really in my mind, the animal that embodies the American West. And it's not only that, but it's our national mammal. And so it is all things true Americana, excitement. Ralphie is Colorado. She is Boulder. She is what draws people together. You know, no matter what's happening in the football world, the athletics world, they come into Folsom Field for Ralphie the Buffalo. You know, it's not normal for a Buffalo to go out and 50,000 people, but she, she loves doing it. She's super brave when she does it. And I think that transfers to the student population. In 1966, they actually had a buffalo calf that they had on the sidelines, and in 1967 is when the tradition of Ralphie running and leading the football team out onto the field began. So we are Division I varsity athletes, which is a fantastic experience for all of our student athletes that we have on our team. The current Ralphie we have is almost 1,000 pounds. She takes a lot of strength and a lot of speed to handle. So the handlers train year-round at least twice a week. Um, they do an hour of sprint training, conditioning training, and then an hour of weightlifting. Good, Alec. One of the reasons we do so much training is to prevent injuries. And so if you're in the weight room, like, I need a lot of, from you, and I need you to always be out there and giving it your best shot. Ralphie Five, who's in the photo behind me in her prime, could run up to 25 miles an hour. Ralphie Six, who's our current uh, mascot is still growing. She's probably running about 20 miles an hour right now. A lot of what I'm focusing on is teaching them how to listen when the animal is telling you what they want. And so it's little things like, okay, you know, you see her move this way. She did that because when you stepped in really quickly and closely to her space, she felt uncomfortable. So how else can we approach this so that she feels comfortable and you know what she wants? Ralphie and I are very close. Uh, I kind of helped raise her. We got her as an orphan buffalo from a uh, ranch has stayed over. So I've known her since she was about four months old. Having been raised so differently as an orphan, people are what she loves. And so she sees people and that's who she wants to spend time with. And so I'll be out there at her ranch and we clean up her pastures every single day and we're out there and we do enrichment every single day. It's always important to remember that especially with these more tame animals, they are still unpredictable. They are still 850 pounds. And so you can't get wrapped up in the idea that she's your friend and forget about your safety procedures. You know, I grew up with a background in cattle and I've learned so much about buffalo that they are just very, very different. They're significantly more unpredictable. They are still very wild at heart. And so I think that we get some mixed feedback, honestly. There are some people who come in and think that this is fantastic and they love this and they really, really support us. Um, and there are others that wish that we would not do what we do. And I think that the, the important thing to remember is that we do love these animals. We do appreciate and respect how important they are to not only this community, but other communities throughout the world. The buffalo are the most sacred animal to me and our people. And you know, that symbiotic relationship that we had with the buffalo also goes all across the environment. The prairie dogs love the buffalo. The grass loves the buffalo. The way the buffalo don't eat grass down to the stubs, they, they make it so that it's, it, it renews itself. The buffalo wallows create water collection areas in harsh areas where there's no water so that when there is water you know it creates those those kinds of environments their hooves turn the soil and help recycle nutrients their hooves also will make little microclimates for the native seeds who are adapted to this type of a climate to establish and grow so they're a very important species to the prairie ecosystem. And so we wanted to make sure that they were included in this restoration effort as well. This is the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge, just 10 miles northeast of downtown Denver in Commerce City, Colorado. Bison have a very definite ecological history and purpose on prairies. So we just figured that bringing bison in would help bring back the ecology that was missing here for years. This refuge was established uh, back in 1992 
when Congress passed the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge Act, which set the groundwork for turning this area into a refuge. The refuge itself is 15,000 acres. The bison, currently we have on about 6,300 acres and hope to have up to about 11,500 acres. We have a uh, 10, 12 mile uh, wildlife drive that people can drive around to uh, see all the wildlife. I just always love watching the bison, especially on days like today where it's a little cloudy or a little cooler out. You see that they really enjoy this cooler weather. Um, it's just really neat to see them in their natural environment like that. We are really hoping that we are a place where people in the urban communities here can come experience wildlife and nature and really find their place in this natural environment. A few times a week I take walks at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and I'm able to see the buffalo and it's just really special. I don't know, I feel like there's a connection and I just hold them in really high regard and I have a lot of respect um, for who they are, what they represent and how they are just the providers to my people. We're hoping to continue to conserve bison in their historical landscapes and really help use that traditional ecological knowledge, that indigenous knowledge to help with managing these bison into the future. I feel like even going into the future, what happens to them is gonna to happen to us because we are so connected and they are part of our nation. And the fact that they've survived this attempt of almost being extinct is very similar to what happened to our people. And I think talking about it and keeping that alive is, is very important. It's a very complex, difficult history, but for us, when we look at it now, the buffalo is still returning. And what's so unique about bison is how they raise themselves, is that they live off of the land. They're very much, even now, still kind of a wild animal. I think as a Native American, having buffalo back on our landscape is really empowering to see them and be near them. You just feel a surge of connection and spiritual strength and awe because they're majestic creatures. They really are majestic. Restoration of buffalo is a challenge for all of us in America. It's an important challenge and it's something that needs to be done, not just for American Indian people, but for everybody. And so if we can get to bison one million, and it might take 20 years, then we've helped bring this species back from extinction. And the more people I can help get into the bison industry, that means there's more bison being raised and we're closer to bison one million because then they'll never go away. So the refuge is part of that greater initiative toward conserving bison. We are, of course, a small component of the bigger picture, right? We can't do this alone. We can't do this in a vacuum. We have to all work together to conserve bison in their native landscape. My hope for the future is that we as indigenous people will embrace the sovereignty that we have inherently to reestablish our food systems that are more healthy for our communities and also to be advocates for having the bison available in an aspect that is respectful to them as spiritual beings on this earth because they are strong spiritual living beings and they need to be respected. None of us own the wildlife. The wildlife is just part of the earth and we're all just part of the earth. And when I stand here, I'm not standing here as overseer of these buffalo. I'm just here as part of this planet. And so I think people need to really change um, how they perceive themselves on this earth. My message to all, to all people, if you really want to make a difference in the world, find a way to bring buffalo back. If you want to make a difference in this world, bring buffalo back.